All right, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here and be able to stand here and be able to um, preach this morning. Uh, I'm going to share something with you this morning that um, has been kind of on my mind a lot. Something, you know, you hear a lot of times preachers say, you know, this is something that's been on their heart and they want to share it. And, um, you know, and I think that's true in a lot of cases. And there's been something that's on my mind and I want to talk about and share with you guys this morning. My message this morning is going to be titled Complacency or Christ. And, the re- you know, and the reason why I want to talk about that is, is I'm not here to say this morning that any of you guys or any of us are being complacent in our lives, but I'm, I want us to think about, you know, maybe there's some areas we are complacent in our lives and what the difference between being complacent and being content in Christ, because there's a difference. And uh, we're going to start out this morning in Philippians chapter 4. If you guys turn there with me, Philippians 4. Let's just give thanks before we start this morning. Father, thank you for us being able to come here and be able to look at your word together in the time that we're going to have here afterwards of fellowshipping together and remembering what you've done for us on the cross. And we give thanks always by Christ. Amen. So one of the greatest, one of the greatest dangers, I think, in the life of a believer and a believer's life and in a believer's walk is going to be complacency. Because a lot of times we begin to be complacent in a lot of, we're going to talk about some of the things maybe we're complacent in our lives. But contentment, and you know what, I want to say this first, contentment in Christ is something to be sought after and it's something to be celebrated. You guys, okay? But complacency is something that is very, very different. Having contentment means that no matter what happens in our lives, we are going to be fully satisfied with who we are in Christ. And in Philippians chapter 4, if you guys look there with me, Philippians 4 and verse 10, Paul's writing here, he's talking to the church, he's finishing off his epistle, and he says, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but he lacked opportunity. The church here wanted to help. But there wasn't really an opportunity that they had. But now they have the opportunity, so they're helping. And Paul says in verse 11, Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have what? So how do we learn? Well, we learn through experience. We learn through studying God's word. And we begin to understand some things. And he says, "For Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be what? So what do we as believers need to learn and be? It says that we need to learn to be content. And he says in verse 12, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Well, what does that mean? That means Paul understands and has the knowledge and understanding that whether things are going so great in life and everything is good in life, he knows how to deal with that. And he also knows how to deal with when he's hungry and he's starving and he doesn't have anything. You know what he knows he can do? He understands he can be content in Christ. Remember, he said, I have what? Learned to be content there. And so he has this understanding of that. And guess what? We can have that same understanding as well, to be satisfied in where we're at. Verse 12 says, I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to what? Is there going to be times that we as believers suffer need? Yes, but how do we get through it? It says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. Well, how does he strengthen me? He strengthens me by his word working in me. When he says I can do all things, he's talking about being able to be abased and being abounding. He's not talking about, you see sometimes people go and take this verse and apply it in every aspect of their life and they think they're going to succeed because they have this verse maybe written on their face or they get a tattoo of this verse on their body and they think it's going to work that way. But it says that in verse 11 that we have to learn and that we are instructed to be content. Contentment in the life of the believer is something that is wonderful. It's something that's great. And we have the strength to do it because of Christ in us. Having complacency means that no matter what happens, we are fully satisfied with our current personal effort in Christ. But being complacent means, though, that we've kind of began to be stagnant. 
There's a difference between resting in the fact of our identity in Christ and becoming complacent in our identity in Christ. Because Paul, Paul doesn't teach us to be complacent. Paul teaches us that we need to abound more and more. Go to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 9. Philippians 1 and verse 9. He says, In this I pray. So first of all, what's Paul doing? He's praying for the saints. In this I pray that your love may abound to a certain point. You guys can now be complacent where you're at. No, what does he say? He said that your love may, he said that you may abound yet more and more in knowledge and in all judgment. Why? Why would we do that? He says that he may approve things that are what? Excellent. That he may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. How do we do it? What is, how am I able to do this? Guess what? It's not what I'm able to do. It's what Christ does. He says, being filled with the fruits of righteousness, which are by Jesus Christ. So how am I not going to be complacent? How am I going to abound more and more in knowledge and judgment? Because I'm going to be filled with the fruits of righteousness. How do we get filled with the fruits of righteousness? By studying and reading God's word. Not being complacent and saying, oh, I think I know enough in my life now. Gaining that knowledge and judgment. Learning more. Complacency is dangerous for believers because it means that we are not growing. Paul wanted and prayed that we would grow more and more. We pray for each other that we grow more and more. Webster's Dictionary of the uh, definition of the word complacency, it says that it is a feeling of being satisfied with how things are and not wanting to try to make them better. You know, maybe that there's a section in our life, maybe there's a part in our life that might be like that. For me, that sounds something that is very, very dangerous in the life of the believer, is to get to that point. If you go with me to Ephesians chapter 4, Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians 4. In verse 1, Paul says, I, therefore... Well, what does it mean to say therefore? That means he's saying, because of the information I just gave you. Now we're going to see Paul say something here. He says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you. What does that mean? The information that you have now, I'm going to beg of you. You know, we don't really use the term beseech today. But he says, I'm going to beg of you. I beseech you that he walk how? Worthy. All of us have parents. And what's the number one thing in a child's life that he wants to do to his parents? He wants to make them proud, right? He wants to have his parents satisfied and well-pleased with how he's doing or she's doing, right? It says that we as believers need to walk worthy, something different though, he says, of the vocation wherewith ye are called. Guess who is called? Each and every single one of us. Not just a guy that says, I have been called by the Lord to be placed into the ministry. You know who's been called? Each and every single one of us that has trusted the gospel. We have all been called. And then we learn things, and then guess what we need to do with those things? He says that we need to walk worthy of it. A vocation is what? It's a job. It's a duty. Something that we have to do. Tim was talking this morning and said that it's not optional to be an ambassador for Christ. Once we're saved, guess what we are? We're ambassadors of Christ. You know what we need to do with that? It says here, he says that we need to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. We as believers need to do that in light of the doctrine we learned in Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. And what did it teach us? It taught us that we are accepted in Christ. We're accepted in the beloved. We're we're now predestined. It doesn't deal with our salvation, but now we are predestined to do good works in Christ. If we become complacent, maybe some of those works don't come out. Go with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. By the way, this isn't a message to make us feel guilty. This is just a message to really maybe consider some things. And it's been very challenging to myself and a lot of things that we're discuss, going to be discussing. 
1 Thessalonians 2, verse 10. It says, Ye are witnesses, and God also, how holily and justly and unblameably we behaved ourselves among you that believe. Can we say that always about ourselves, that we behaved holy and justly? You know, maybe not. He says, As you know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. Well, what did he charge him with? He says in verse 12, that he would walk worthy of who? Who do we walk worthy of? Who should we walk worthy of? It says that we have the opportunity and we should be walking worthy of God who hath called who? You. He says you there. Who's the you? That's all of us. That you would walk worthy of God who hath called you unto his kingdom and glory. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing because when he received the word of God which he heard of us, ye received it not as the word of who? Well, what's the word of men? Well, when you look at the words of men, is it accurate? No, you can ask one guy a question and you're going to have 20 other different opinions about that one question. But it says they didn't receive it as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God which effectually worketh also in you and the key part of that verse, that what? That believe. So if there's some things going on maybe Maybe it's because we're not trusting the word of God completely. Because it says God's promise here is, is that if I believe his word, what does it do? It effectually works in us that believe. We as believers all can walk worthy. You know, you might say, well, I've done so many bad things. I don't think I can ever walk worthy of God. I don't think I can ever walk worthy of the vocation. I, I, I just don't think I can do it. What's the problem in that sentence? I, 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 I. Guess what? It's not I that lives, but what? It says it up there. It is Christ that lives within us. That's how we walk worthy of walking worthy in our identity we have in Christ. But we have to believe what God says about our identity. We have to trust the word of God. A lot of the time we as believers like to blame Satan for all our problems in life. And say, oh man, I'm having all these problems because, you know, I'm being attacked by Satan. A lot of times we want to blame others for the problems in our life. You know, you ever, see, you ever meet someone and you ask them a question and they like to blame everybody else? We all know someone like that, right? Another thing people like to do is, and especially in believers, is they like to say, well, that's the old man that's in me. Well, guess what? Romans chapter 6 teaches us that the old man is what? That he is dead. He is crucified. So when we say it's the old man that's in me, we're using that as a, and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and say, I might get myself in trouble, but we're using that as a cop out in our lives. Because it says that therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. So if we're saying the old man is allowing me to do this, guess what? It's because we're not allowed, we are not living in our new identity we have in Christ. It's not the old man that's doing that, it's us. And so when, I, when, we get to the, when we look at this and look at the blame and we like to play the blame game, a lot of times, you know what we need to do? We need to take a look in the mirror and assess it. Why am I doing that? Well, it's because I'm not trusting the word of God. You know, we always come back to that. It's always because we're not trusting the word of God. Our old man is dead. Why am I allowing that to affect who I am in Christ today? Something to think about. If you go with me to Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4. And verse 17. Ephesians 4. Verse 17 says, This I say therefore. Remember what we said about the word therefore? So the information he just gave. He said, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that he henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk. In the what? It says that they're walking in the vanity of their mind. Well, what does that mean? It means that there's a, it's something that's empty. It's something that's void. It's something that's dark. It's something that's evil. It has no, it's not substance. And that's how they're walking. But guess who else can walk like that? We can. It doesn't say that once we're saved, we're immune to that. 
That's why Paul tells us, he says that he says, therefore, and testifies in the Lord that what? Ye henceforth. That means from this point on. So was the church possibly walking in some of those ways? Yeah, there's possibly believers in there walking that way. He said, so don't do that. Verse 18 says, having the understanding darkened. When we, as believers, when believers become complacent, you know what happens? We begin to be darkened. We're not looking at the full picture. We're focusing on the things of the earth and not focusing on the things of heaven. Having the understanding darkened. No light. We're insens become insensitive. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. And you see so many examples of that in the Old Testament with the nation of Israel. When it talks about the blindness of their heart, they begin what? They follow the things of God for a little bit and then what do they do? They start going back to the things of what they want to do and they do the things that are contrary to God and guess what? They become blinded to the things of God and they do the, what pleases themselves. Verse 19 says, who being past feeling. Do you know a believer can get to the point that they don't feel sin anymore? A good example of that is, is when you're out in public, how many times do you hear the Lord's name taken in vain? Now a question we need to ask ourselves, how many times have we said something about it? How many times have we been in public and someone does something that we have the opportunity that we can minister to them and we walk away. Later on, maybe we feel bad about it, but at that moment, guess what? Maybe we're not feeling that in the moment. If Paul saw someone do that, now I'm, I'm trying not to be guilty about it, but it's something that I've been challenging myself in this. When Paul saw someone that we, he could have ministered to, someone he could have given the gospel to, do you think he walked away from it? No, he prays that his mouth may be open boldly. How should we as believers be speaking? Boldly. How many of us have a friend that we've never shared the gospel to? You know? We as believers, you know, and, and I've been thinking about this, we as believers have the greatest news in the world. Eternal life living in heaven with Christ, reigning in heaven with Christ, and sometimes we're ashamed to share it. We're fearful to share it. We have the greatest news. When, when, when someone is getting ready to get married, what's the, what's the thing they want to always talk about? How excited they are to get married, right? I can't wait to get married. When they're going to have a child, what is the next thing? Oh, man, I'm so ex we're going to have a baby. We get to raise this baby. We get to raise it to the glory of God. They're excited. We have eternal life. We have salvation. We have the greatest message of all time. Israel didn't even have this message. We have the message that Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again the third day. And you get to have eternal life if you trust that. You don't have to go to a church. You don't have to follow the law. You don't have to do anything except place our faith into the faith of Christ. And then you know what he does? He takes us and then he seals us with that Holy Spirit of promise. But sometimes we're afraid to share that. Isn't that, when we're here, we're excited about it. You know, and I always feel rejuvenated when I'm in church and when I'm around believers. But then we get in the world and we kind of become different people sometimes. But the people we're in here we should be out there. And I'm challenging myself on that because there's a lot of missed opportunities that I have and I just, I drop the ball. I have the words that could say, that, that we could share with them and guess what? Those words can give them eternal life because they come from God. We have the words of God. Something that's so precious, something that we have so accessible today. We should be taking advantage of that. We need to, as believers, not walk as others walk. In verse 20, in Ephesians 4, he tells the church here, he says, but ye have not so learned, who? You haven't learned the things that you've been taught in the book of Romans. You haven't learned the foundational truths. You're not applying the foundational truths. You're not applying the identity Christ has given you in your life. We need to be applying that in our lives 
every single day. There's an example I'd like to share with you in the book of Amos. The book of Amos. It's over the national, nation of Israel. Daniel, Hosea, Joel, then you're at Amos. It's one of those books we probably don't go to that often, but I, I found an interesting section here. And it's talking about the, the captivity that Israel's getting ready to go into. And Amos is telling the people here, in Amos chapter 6, and verse 1, Amos chapter 6 and verse 1, it says, Great to them that are at ease. No, what does it say? It says, Woe to them that are in ease in Zion, and trust in the mountain of Samaria, which are named chief of the nations, to whom the house of Israel came. What's wrong with that verse? It says, Woe to them because why? It says, They trust in the mountain of Samaria. They're not trusting in God. They're trusting in what they've built, what they have. And it says, Woe to them that are at ease in Zion. The people in this instance are at ease, and it's not a good thing. It says in verse 2, Pass ye unto Calni, and see, and from thence to Hamath the Great. Then go down to Goth of the Philistines. Be they better than these kingdoms, or their border greater than your border? Verse 3, Ye that put far away the evil day, and cause the seed of violence to come near, that lie upon beds of ivory, and stretch themselves upon their couches. What does it sound like they're doing? They're not doing anything. They're relaxing, enjoying life. And it says, and eat the lambs out of the flock and the calves out of the midst of the stall that chant to the sound of viol and invented themselves instruments of music like David. Well, what are they doing? It sounds like they're having a big old party, doesn't it? Sounds like they're having a good old time. But what did Amos start off with? He says, woe unto them. They're having a big party here. It's not a good thing. He says, verse 7, Therefore now shall they go captive with the first captive to go captive, and the banquet of them stretch themselves shall be removed. Fortunately, today under grace, we don't have that happening. We are not going to go captive anywhere. We can be taken, Brother Tim shared this morning, about how we as believers can be taken captive at what? By Satan's will. We're not going to go physically captive like this. Because their blessings is an earthly blessings and their focus is their kingdom that God has promised them on earth. We understand our blessings are where? Heavenly places in Christ. Theirs are earthly blessings. But it says in verse 1, Woe to them that are at ease. Sometimes we as believers maybe are at ease because maybe we're relying on something other than God and His Word. And we need to just examine ourselves over that maybe. If you go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4. I just love First and Second Timothy. It's always been like one of my favorite, my favorite books to go to growing up. Um, you know, just to be able to see a, a young man in ministry doing the things in Paul's encouraging words to him and writing to him and Paul's final charges are coming here in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. He says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. What's the first thing that he says Timothy needs to be doing here? Preach the what? What's the first thing that we need to be doing? Preach the word. Well, I preach the word when I come to church on Sundays, so I'm, I'm doing pretty good. But he says, that's why I see God is a lot smarter than us. So God puts things in here that we don't have wiggle room. I love it because I always like to find a way and a deal to try to get something better out of the deal. And, you know, God doesn't leave wiggle room. And he says, preach the word, be instant, in season, what? Out of season. How many of you guys like watching like college football or football? Some of you guys like watching it, right? What are they? Are they in season right now? No, they're out of season. What are they doing? Well, they're training. They're doing things. If, a, if you asked them to go play a football game today, they probably wouldn't be equipped and ready to do it, right? 
They do probably a lot better than us, but they wouldn't be ready and up to par. But Paul says that we as believers need to preach the word, be instant in season, out of season. So that means at any moment, at any time, what needs to happen? We need to be ready. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and what? Doctrine. You hear that word a lot here because it's so important. Verse 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers, having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the what? From the truth. When we share sometimes, guess what people do? They don't want to hear it. They don't want to hear the truth. But that doesn't mean we stop. And shall be turned into fables, but watch thou in all things, endure what? What are we going to endure as believers? Afflictions. Do the work of in what? Evangelists. Make full proof of thy ministry. Should we all be doing the work of an evangelist? Absolutely. How do people get saved without preaching the word? We need to be doing the work of an evangelist. We need to be on with the work. We need to be not thinking about to myself, man, when is the last time I shared the gospel with someone? That should be, man, I shared the gospel with someone yesterday when I was at the store. Man, I shared the gospel yesterday when I had the opportunity. I saw someone that looked like they were hurting. I went over and just talked with them. You know, people sometimes will say that personal connections are lost today because of social media. There is nothing more personal than someone putting their hand on you and giving you the word of God. We as believers shouldn't have to think about the last time we did that. Maybe a question we need to ask ourselves is, is how many times are we fearful to share? And if we're fearful, our fearful times that we share outweigh the times that we do share, maybe that's a problem that's in our lives. Another question maybe we can ask ourselves is, is when was the last time we invited someone to church? Why, why would we say that? Well, because... We should be excited about the church we have here, the assembly we have here. We understand we, is the bo- we are the members of the church and we're the body of Christ and we meet in this building. But when was the last time we invited someone to come with us? When was the last time we were excited to share the gospel with someone and have them come to church with us? That's a question we all have to ask ourselves because guess what? We should be so excited to say, hey, listen, I know the perfect place that we can go to. We can go and learn God's word, study God's word together, fellowship around God's word, and grow in him. But sometimes we're like, yeah, I go to this church down in Edgewater. You know, it's a really old building. Um, it's in a neighborhood. It's not, it's not that nice. Uh, it's really small. You know, and wow, I really, really want to come to your church. No, that's not how that works. We, we the, the church and the design of what we are supposed to be doing is to be lights in the world. And we have that message here. We have, the good, we have good doctrine here in a world that needs it. And there's people looking for it, but it's up to us to be doing that work and not being complacent in, well, I'm glad I know it. I like the people there, you know, and you know, that's good enough for me. We need to be excited about it. Excited to always share it. Any opportunity, share it. Be excited. Paul says in Romans chapter 1, you guys know this verse. I'm sure you guys were expecting this verse at some point. Romans chapter 1, in verse 16. Let's, let's actually, let's go back a little bit here. In verse 14, he says, I am debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to the wise and to the unwise. Well, why is he a debt? Paul tells us not to have debt to people. Well, he's indebted to them because he has the gospel and he needs to share it. Verse 15 says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are at Rome also. Are we ready to preach the gospel to Edgewater? Are we ready to preach the gospel to Port Orange? Are we ready to preach the gospel in Titusville? Are we ready to do that? Because Paul says he's ready to do it to those in Rome. And he says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. Well, why is he not ashamed? 
Well, the same reason we know we shouldn't be ashamed. He says, because for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The, the gospel of Christ is what? It's power. It's something that we have. The world's going to think we're foolish. It says in 1 Corinthians, for the preaching of the cross is to them that perish, what? Foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is what? Power. It's the power of God. That's who we have in us. That's who we have working in us. Christ works in us. When we're tired, guess what? It's not I that works, but it's Christ. His grace is sufficient. That means His grace, it, it, there isn't anything that needs to be added to it. It's everything. Sometimes we're fearful. So go with me to 2 Timothy chapter 1. We need to not be ashamed. <clears throat> Second Timothy 1, Paul's writing this letter. You know, and it's kind of, you see what we, we just read in chapter 4. He's telling him to preach the word, be ready, be instant in season, do the work of an evangelist. But in the beginning, you see Timothy's a little bit tired. He's worn out. Doesn't that happen for all of us? Especially in ministry. You get tired, you get worn out. Well, why do you say that? Well, if you look at in um, verse 4, Paul writes in chapter 1, 2 Timothy 1, verse 4, he says, Greatly desiring to see thee, being mindful of thy what? Of thy tears. Well, why is Timothy in tears? Well, everybody's turning their back on them. They go and they preach the word, people are getting saved, the doctrine is working. Then they come back and you know what happened? The church has turned their back on Paul. They've turned their back on Timothy. They've forsook him. They've left him. Wouldn't that get tiring? Yeah. But then Paul tells them to stir up the gift. Stir up the word of God that's in you. Stir up the doctrine. Be excited. Bring it back to the forefront of our minds. Why? He says in verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of what? So when I'm fearful to preach, or I'm fearful to share the gospel with someone, or I'm fearful to invite someone to church, guess what? That isn't coming from God, because it tells me here, for God had not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Then Paul says, be not therefore, what? Ashamed. Why? Because God has given us the spirit of power, of love, and of a sound mind. So when we're fearful, when we're ashamed, we need to ask ourselves, why am I complacent and not sharing the gospel? Why am I fearful? Why am I ashamed? I have the greatest message of all time. We have the greatest message of all time. So why are we complacent in that? We shouldn't be. We should be so excited to share the gospel all the time. You look at the guys around Paul going around suffering, being beaten, what do they do? They get thrown into prison and you know what they do? They sing praises unto God. They're excited about the doctrine. They're not complacent in it. They're content of who they are in Christ. But they don't get to the point that they say, I'm not going to share Christ. Because we need to be ready. There's people ready for the truth and looking for it. Brother Tim shared this morning that we don't have a choice to be an example. You know, I never really thought of it that way. I thought that was good because he's right. Because we're either going to be a good example or we're going to be a bad example. We're an example one way or another. I think we all want to be that good example. If you go with me to, there's an example of a church here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I think we've talked about this, you know, this verse quite often, but it's, it's such a powerful section in the Bible of what Paul writes about this church here. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. <clears throat> and verse 3. He says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. You know, this, this verse, you know what this verse does? It gives a summary of what the Christ life is all about. 
the work of faith, the labor of love, and the patience of hope. Guess what this church had? He says when he thinks of this church, that's what he remembers about them. He remembers their work of faith, their labor of love, and their patience of hope. And these three are the key components that are designed to bring fullness in the life of a believer. They represent, you know what else they represent? They represent spiritual maturity of having those three things. The work of faith means that we are applying God's word to the details of our life. Well, why? Because our faith is resting in God's word. We're believing it. We're trusting it. It's going to work. We read that verse in 1 Thessalonians 2.13. What does it say? The word of God effectually works in you that what? Believe it. That's the work of faith, trusting God's word. 2 Timothy 3, verse 16. Just keep your hand in 1 Thessalonians, but in 2 Timothy chapter 3, and verse 16. Believing and trusting God's word. Well, what does God's word have in it? It says in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, it says, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is what? It's profitable. It has something we can profit in. Well, what do we get to profit in? Money? Well, no, that's not what it says, right? It says it is profitable for doctrine. How many of us need doctrine? I'll be the first one to put my hand up and say, I need doctrine. How many of us need reproof? We should all be the first ones to put our hands up on that. How many of us, it says, and for correction? How many of us need that? We all need it. For instruction in righteousness. Guess what? We all need that too. Why? Why do we need that? He says that the man of God, that covers women too, by the way, okay? When it says man like that in the Bible, it covers everybody. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Truly furnished unto all good works. That means we are going to be completely equipped by the word of God. Wow. Something to be excited about, right? That God gave us his son, Jesus Christ. And then you know what he does? He doesn't just leave us with that. He also gives us his word so we know how to live while we're still here on the earth. And fortunately, we as believers have a Bible we can trust. Amen? The believer's life should also be motivated by love. The love of Christ, you know what the love of Christ can do for us? It can produce a love for people. Well, what does that mean? It means that when we begin to understand how Christ and his love, he decided in himself as God to become flesh, to live a life that we never could, and lives the perfect life, doesn't sin, fulfills the law, comes to his people as he promised. You know what they do to him? They take him, they scourge him, they beat him, and then you know what they do? They have him nailed to a cross. But in that, when Satan thought, oh man, your nation has rejected you, I have won, Christ says, no, the intent of me coming was to die on that cross, to pay the penalty of sin for all. And then he gets buried, and then you know what he does? He fulfills what he promised, he rises again the third day. Why? To bring us justification in our lives. Without the resurrection, guess what? It's all meaningless. He brings us justification in our life. And you know why he did that? Because he loved us. 2,000 years before we were born, he loved us. Sinners, ones that break his laws, ones that don't deserve his love. That's unconditional love. And when we begin to understand how he had that unconditional love, guess what? We can start showing that love to others. Paul writes, if you go with me to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Second Corinthians chapter 5. In verse 14, it says, for the love of who? It doesn't say for love in Christ. It says for the love of Christ constraineth us. That means it weighs down on us. It causes us to think. 
He says, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves. How many times are we living unto ourselves in our lives? Well, it says that he died so that henceforth we don't live unto ourselves, but unto him which died for them and what? Rose again. The love of Christ should be constraining us. It should be on our mind. And what it does is, is when it's on our mind, it produces fruit that shows to other people. And we begin to labor out of love. And people see that. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. If you go with me, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. Well, I'm, I think I'm at a point that I'm loving enough and I'm doing a good enough job. I go to church, I help there, and I do some things. You know, I'm a pretty good husband. I take care of my kids. You know, I think I'm doing pretty good in my life. Well, guess what he writes, he says, in 1 Thessalonians 3, verse 12, he says, And the Lord make you to what? Increase. What does it mean to increase? Well, you're going to add, it says, and abound. So to increase means to also abound in love towards one another and towards all men, even as we do towards what? You. So Paul reminds him he's doing that towards them. But what should we do? It says we should increase and abound in love towards another, one towards another. Guess what? The people of this world need to hear the greatest message of love. The greatest, you want to say, oh man, people love love stories. You know what the greatest love story ever is? How Christ loved us and gave himself for us. That's the greatest love story. And then we labor out of that. If you go to 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 9, he says to the church here, but it's touching brotherly love. Ye need not that I write unto you. Wow. Paul tells them here, he says, man, you guys are doing such a good, I don't even need to write unto you about this. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. Verse 10, and indeed he do it towards all the brethren which are in all Macedonia, but we beseech you. So they're doing this. They're doing a great job with this. But he says, but we beseech you. We beg of you, brethren, that he increase what? More and more. So what does that mean? Don't be complacent. Increase more and more. Well, how do I do that? We don't do it. God's word working in us does it. Isn't that exciting? to increase, abound in love. This world needs it. The world is so full of hate and violence and terrible things taking place. We have a message of grace, peace, mercy, love, kindness, gentleness, righteousness. People are always looking for something perfect in their lives, right? Well, here you go. Here you go. It's right here. It's right in front of our face. We need to do that. And when we get tired, you know what the believer is sustained by? Our hope. If you look in 1 Thessalonians, we're right there. Verse 3 says, Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. And what else do they have? Patience of hope. We have the greatest hope. And our life is sustained by that because we as believers can patiently continue our work of faith and labor of love. Why? Why? Because we know that Christ can return at any moment. Any moment. That's the patience of hope that we have. That we can wait patiently. If you go to 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16, it talks about that. Well, what's the hope? Well, he writes to them later on in the epistle. He says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16, he says, For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, and the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God... And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And I just love this part. He says, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Forever. Perfect. And you know what we do with that? We don't become complacent and say, man, I'm so glad I have this information. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. When we have a fellow believer that's hurting, you know what we do? We don't just sit there and say, oh man, I'm so sorry for you. I'm so sorry. No, we comfort them with the scripture. Guess what? We all drop the ball on that. 
We want to just have pity and feel bad for people. Guess what? That's our time to minister, to build them back up, to edify the body. A good question, you know, I ask myself sometimes, when is the last time I edified the body of Christ? Because guess what? That's what we should all be doing. Edifying one another, building each other, comforting one another. Because we have the greatest hope. Titus chapter 2, if you go with me. Titus chapter 2. How am I doing on time? All right. Titus chapter 2. I know you guys are all hungry, man. That food smells wonderful, doesn't it? Titus chapter 2, verse 13. It says something that we should be doing. It says, looking for that blessed hope. Well, who's that? In the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking forward to. It's not something if it's going to happen. It's when is it going to happen? Well, guess what? It can happen at any moment, any point in time. We have the greatest hope. These are not just words on a page. You know what this is? It is our reality as believers. It's our reality. We should be excited about that. These same three characteristics are seen in the church there. We're not going to spend a lot of time on that because I want to try to wrap up. You know what it means when a preacher says he's wrapping up? Absolutely nothing. Okay? But in 1 Thessalonians, this church here, the example of their work of faith and their labor of love and their patience of hope it was seen in action. In verse 5 in 1 Thessalonians, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in what? In power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction. It wasn't easy, but you know what they did? They received it. How? With joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were in samples to all them that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. These were huge cities, and they knew about them. They were excited about that. Paul's excited for them. He says, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Would Paul have to speak to us, though, is the question. He tells them he doesn't have to speak to them about it. But would he have to speak to me about that? Probably. I would say yes. But he says to them, no. He says, for they, verse 9, them show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you. And how ye turn to God from what? Idols. Well, what is that? That is their work of faith. They trusted God. And you know what they did? They turned from that, from worshiping idols, to God. What is idols? Well, it's not this little wooden statue. It's all sorts of things in, the li in our lives. If you go to Colossians 3 and verse 5, just keep your hand in 1 Thessalonians. Colossians 3 and verse 5. You know what's great about God's word? It defines what all these terms mean. So what is idolatry? What does that mean? What is idols? What is all this stuff? Paul writes in Colossians 3 verse 5, Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth. What is that? Us our bodies, our flesh. Fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and what? How many of us covet? You know what it says that is? It says, which is idolatry. It's not just worshiping an idol that you have. It's things we do in our life. One of the greatest examples of that is our cell phones. How many of us can go a day without picking up that phone? How many of us can go two days without picking up that phone? Oh man, I got the itches now, right? You know one of my favorite parts of going on vacation? I put my phone on airplane mode and I leave it. We're addicted to that sometimes and sometimes it's our idol. We need to have the work of faith. The labor of love, if you go to 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 9, it says, And how ye turn to God from idols to what? To serve. So they didn't just turn and say, okay, we're happy with the fact that now we're saved. We're good. 
It says to serve the living and what? True God. That would be the labor of love. And then what do they do? Well, I'm tired, I'm worn out. And to wait for a son from heaven, we have hope. And you can see that right there in that. You know that progression there is the same thing in ministry? A lot of people begin a ministry not fully knowing what they're getting into. You know, Des, when he told me, I told him I want to be involved in ministry, he said, no, you don't. You don't want to be a part of that because the stresses that come from that. But you begin that work of faith, trusting Christ in his word. You know what the work of faith turns into? It begins to turn into a labor of love. And you develop a deep love and bond to people when you do it. It's a good bond. Sometimes Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians, he says, the more I love you, the less I be loved. You know, I don't feel that way here. But imagine, you know, that church there, Paul's giving himself, he's tired. And he says, man, the more I love you guys, the less I be loved. So what can sustain someone when they're at that point? The patience of hope. Knowing that there's hope. Even when they go through difficult times, because guess what? In ministry and being a part of the gospel and preaching the word, guess what? There is going to be tough times. It's going to be hard. But we as believers stay faithful and determined because of understanding we have a patience of hope. In 1 Corinthians 13, it talked about three things that abide in the life of the believer. Faith, hope, and what? Charity. What three things do we see right here in 1 Thessalonians 1? The three things that abide. Functioning, working in the life of the believer. If love doesn't motivate us, you know what happens? We become empty and hollow. It talks about that in 1 Corinthians 13. Now in closing. What does that mean? Nothing, right? But we're going to close here, okay? The grace life is not us trying to muster the strength and willpower to do something for Jesus. You know, we put a lot of emphasis on that in our lives that I need to do something for Jesus. He did so much for me. I need to do something for him. Guess what? That's not how it works. He works in us by his word working in us. All that we must find, we need to have in our power and anything in our strength, we need to find it in Christ. And we need to live a life that is excited about the doctrine, not complacent about the doctrine but that's excited about the doctrine. In Ephesians 6, that's where I want to end. It's in Ephesians 6. In verse 19, Paul tells them, you know, you need to be praying and have supplication for all the saints. And then he asks the church here for something. You know, Paul, Paul's asking them for something. Whoa. In verse 19, he says, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. You know what we need to pray for? That our mouths may be opened boldly. You know what else we need to do? We need to pray for one another that our mouths may be opened boldly. Not just for ourselves. He says he asked them to pray for him. So we need to pray for one another. Why? He says, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly, and you know what he puts here? As I ought to speak. So I asked the question when we started this morning in the title, complacency or Christ? God is, I love, the, God is so great because it's black or white with God. It's not gray. We have to make a choice in our lives. Are we going to be complacent? Or are we going to live the life Christ gave us to live? Let us as believers be excited about the doctrine. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Not being fearful. Being unashamed of the gospel of Christ. Because he's given us the means to do so through his word. Isn't that a wonderful and great thing that God has done for us? And he gives us the sustaining strength and power to be able to do that. Amen? Let's give thanks. Father, thank you for us being able to come here and just...
look at your word on what it has to say about being complacent and, and how that we can draw our strength off of you and your word. May we as believers walk worthy of who you have made us in Christ. May we not walk as others in the world walk and as other maybe believers that aren't walking correctly. May we walk as those people you have made us in your son, Jesus Christ. And we give thanks always by Christ. Amen.